Welcome to the Speak Up Newport uh, meeting for March. I think you're going to find this program very interesting, and I'll be introducing the chair uh, of the program in just a moment. But I want to tell you a little bit about Speak Up Newport. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan citizens group organized to promote the common good and general welfare of the Newport Beach community. Our group was founded in 1979. It is a membership organization. Our memberships are very reasonable, $25 a year and $50 a year for a sustaining membership. We appreciate that support. It's more of a gesture of support than, um, uh, than a fundraiser. And we present a monthly forum here in this room <laughs> on the second Wednesday of the month at 5.15, beginning with a social hour um, uh, where the uh, refreshments are provided by the bungalow restaurant, and then the, uh, the meeting follows. We do two additional things. We put on the mayor's dinner, which we had last month. That is a, uh, an annual event. And we also have a 501c3 foundation, and we raise money for scholarships for Newport Beach High School students. So if you would like to participate, um, join our organization, um, participate and, contr and contribute to our foundation, please go to speakupnewport.com and you can do it all online. We appreciate your support. Now I want to acknowledge a couple of VIPs in the audience. Actually, there's many, many. I'm not going to bore you all with all of them. But we have our former mayor and councilman, Diane Dixon. We have councilman Jeff Herdman. We have our fire chief, Chip Duncan. Thank you. And uh, we have our former mayor and our board member, um, Ed Selich. Ed Selich is the uh, vice president of Speak Up Newport. Oh, I am Deborah Allen. I'm the president. Did I not introduce myself? <laughs> uh, Ed is my vice president, and Ed is chairing the program, and he will introduce this evening's program. Ed. Thank you, Debbie. Well, it's, I think we're going to have a really great program this evening, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Andy Query, uh, our speaker this evening. Andy's a crime prevention specialist with the Newport Beach Police Department. She's worked in the field of crime prevention for over 22 years, starting her career with the San Bernardino Police Department as an assistant project coordinator for the uh, crime-free rental housing program. And uh, in her current position, her assignments include coordinating neighborhood and business watch programs, community presentations to educate residents and visitors on crime trends, and a variety of crime prevention methods. She also conducts commercial and home security inspections. Andy is a member of the California Crime Prevention Officers Association and served as the Regional Three Assistant Director in 2000 and a conference presenter. She has also participated in the California Tourism Safety and Security Conference, both as a committee member and presenter. Now, Andy comes from a uh, <clears throat> law enforcement family. Um, pretty impressive, actually, it's almost scary. Her father's a retired chief of police from the San, Ber San Bernardino Police Department. Her mother is a retired sheriff commander from uh, Marion County, Oregon. Uh, you must have had a strict upbringing, I presume. <laughs> Uh, and in keeping with that tradition, Andy is married uh, to retired Newport Beach Police Lieutenant Randy Query, and together they have two daughters. Um, for our program this evening, Andy's going to give her presentation, then we're going to have uh, questions and answers afterwards, and we have uh, two uh, uh, board members with microphones on each side of the room, so uh, they'll be coming to you if you have questions with the microphone so we can get it on uh, tape and on TV. And with that, I present to you Andy Query.
Okay, let me see if I can get rid of this little thing up there. Perfect. Okay, first, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, this is one of my most favorite topics to talk about because um, it's crime prevention for your home. Their home is your sanctuary. It's the place you want to feel safe. And I look around, and in this community, I have been through so many homes and done so many inspections. And then there's also a lot of homes that I haven't been to that didn't get the message, that didn't find out there was just a few simple things they could have done to deter um, themselves from being victims of a residential burglary. So tonight is very important, and uh, just take note. Any questions, I'll definitely accommodate them after that. One thing I will mention, um, I talked to uh, Debbie Allen just a second ago and told her, this is my last um, public presentation. I turned in my resignation, my two-month resignation. I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom, which is something I've always wanted to do. And so I will offer up home security inspections tonight for just a few households, if you come see me, I will tell you what you need to do because I cannot accommodate all that's going to come our way. Um, but for training purposes, I would love to have some people who would offer up their homes and be flexible. So um, anybody watching this future um, right now, it'll be on hold till about May for further um, home security inspections. But let's get started. So. I wanted to talk to everybody about the kind of two things that affect you most or that you talk most about with your neighbors. And one is theft and burglary from vehicle, and the other one is residential burglaries. And so I wanted you to take a look. This is from 2012, the stats. And you can see our theft and burglary from vehicles has gone up a bit, definitely has gone up a bit. Um, not too much, but, but the other thing that has kept steady with this particular type of crime is that about 70% of these crimes are unlocked. They're crimes of opportunity. People have left things in, in plain view or they've just simply left their car unlocked. This has not changed. Our, our uh, officers, if you talk to them, they could probably write a, one of these reports um, in their sleep because the same things happen. It says, you know, car was left unlocked, items of value were taken, or if they actually had to use force and shatter a window, shattering the window is kind of the number one technique to get into your vehicle. It's not super loud or anything, so and it's quick and easy. So that's what they do. And oftentimes, they'll even hit two cars right next to each other. So shattering a window. And when I read a report and it says shattered window, I can guarantee when I read the loss, it'll either be a purse, laptop, um, maybe a gym bag, something of value laying in the seat. It's worth them shattering the window for. So. Those, those crimes really could be prevented. One, let's just lock up our cars. The second thing is remove your valuables from plain sight. And women, if you have to leave your purse or if you're leaving a gym bag or something in there, put it in the trunk or out of sight prior to arriving at your destination. So the next one that I'm going to kind of focus on tonight is residential burglaries. So as you can see, since 2012, our burglaries have actually gone down. Um, but if you've been a victim of residential burglary, it's up 100% for you. And it, it's probably the most terrifying thing, even if they didn't take anything from you. The fact that somebody has been in your home, your sense of security is far more valuable than any um, priceless jewelry. It, it is important. So that's what I really want to stop. But the one thing that has changed is force has gone up. Where I used to be able to talk to residents here and I tell you that 70% of our residential burglaries are to unlocked homes, either open windows or unlocked doors. That has changed. It has changed over the last um, couple years. I want to say in 2015, I think um, it was about 60% of our, actually 50% of our crimes in 60. And then right now, um, the no force is down to 45%. So the force has definitely um, increased. And you'll see as, as we go forward with the pres presentation why that is. So I know people are concerned, like, do I live in a safe neighborhood? Well, let me tell you something about crime in this community. I've been here 19 years. So there are very few communities that I can think of that have not been hit with residential burglaries. And if you look at this map, and I know it's kind of hard with the lights, but the forced entry are the red, the unlocked are the green, and the attempt are the, the blue. Majority of those attempts were forced that wasn't successful, either because there was an alarm that was on or they just either attempted to get the, the door kicked in and they couldn't get it kicked in, um, or they went to the house and somebody was home. And let me touch on that really quick. Everyone's concerned about what if I'm home and someone tries to break in? Well, here's the good news. A burglary and a, and a um, robbery are two different crimes. We have two different detectives that investigate those. A robbery is a violent crime. It's a crime against a person. You've heard of home invasion robberies. Those are scary. A burglary is what we have in Newport Beach. We have burglaries. Burglaries are homes that people have identified as being vacant or no one at home. Somebody's at dinner or away on vacation. And then they look for a way in. 
If a burglar finds out that somebody is home, typically they leave. If you are asleep, they might still come in the house and go through your living room, your kitchen, in common areas, but rarely do they go into your bedroom. If you're not home, the first place they go is your bedroom. So burglars really do not want to run into you. We've had burglars that have dropped jewelry. They've said, I'm sorry, as they're running past the people as they've walked in. Um, we, what you'll find, if you come home one day and you pull in your driveway and you always leave that pedestrian door unlocked leading from the garage into your house and you come home one day and it's locked, that's a burglar trying to stop you from getting in to allow him time to get out. So burglars are not looking to have any contact with you at all. So if you are at home at night and you hear something, um, make a lot of noise, they're gonna run. Make a lot of noise, put yourself in a safe spot, locked in a bathroom or something, and call 911 immediately, and we're coming. Our response time to these priority one calls, last year it was 3.3 minutes and eight seconds, um, but if you talk to most officers, they say if we're getting a call like that, we're gonna be there lickety split. So, so just know you just have to be able to give us a call and we're coming. But, so that's how some of those attempts have occurred. If you look at the unlock, though, if you kind of draw a line down the middle of the city on Jamboree, you'll see that most of the unlocked burglaries happen on the west side of town. Most of the locked ones occur on the east side of town. Something different that we experienced this year that really jumped up the number of forced entry were the gated communities in Newport Coast. I don't know if you see all those red dots. Those red dots represent almost every gated community in Newport Coast. And it wasn't just one, it wasn't two, it was three, it was multiple ones. And I'm gonna show you some pictures later about how they got in. But they were homes hit while people were on vacation, they were homes hit while people were out to dinner. These guys, and they could be gals, I'm guessing a lot of them guys, just because of the strength that it took to get rid of some of the, take some of the stuff out, um, they were able to get in and out very quickly. Um, just in looking over the years when we've had the ability to kind of pinpoint when a suspect got in and got out, it has been, on average, under three minutes. So it's very quick. So I, then I did one other thing, because I wanted, everyone's thinking, OK, well, they must have more crime over here, or we have less crime. Well, I wanted to look at the last two years, and I wanted to say, if I drew a line right down the bay, what side you know, had more crime as far as residential burglaries? And it was, it's, it's really not much difference. And I think what really changed the numbers, the, the fact that the east side is higher right now, is the crime that we experienced in um, Newport Coast, which was really unlike anything that we have seen. Um, I will say 2013, we did see an increased number of residential burglaries in the gated communities in Newport Coast, but um, the, I really haven't seen that in the last few years. So last year kind of was um, a little different for us there. So I wanted to explain to you what we need to start doing because we have seen crime change. I mentioned more forced entry. So this is important for you to see. I just took the first two months of this year because it is following last year's pattern. The first two um, months of this year, we had 29 residential burglaries. The purple and red represent shattered windows. So that just shows you we had it's actually 10. I put the attempt because what happened on the attempt is there is actually a picture, there's actually a window where they attempted to punch and, and shatter the glass, and then the suspects found an open window. So then they were like, oh, we're not gonna shatter it, we're just gonna go in through the open window. So that really would have left us with, with 10 if they had actually been successful there and not found the open window. But once again, that is a lot of shattered windows. So the other thing I want you to pay attention to. And tonight, my whole message is gonna be layers. It takes layers to secure your house. The best alarm system is not gonna do it. The best camera system is not gonna do it. The best dog is not gonna do it. The best neighbors is not gonna do it. But all those things put together is gonna to be what's gonna make a strong security plan. So why am I saying alarms don't work? So these shattered windows, the suspects are actually, I believe, personally, after I look at every residential burglary report, I open it up, I look at all the photos. I've been doing that for 19 years. What has changed? These smashed windows is what has changed, and you'll see the numbers in a second. But what do they have in common? All but two of those had uh, security signs all over the front of them. So the security sign did not scare them away. There were brand new signs. Some had signs in the front of the yard. Some had signs on all the, on the windows. That did not stop the burglar. So what? 
that sign told a typical window smash burglar is that most likely these homes have a perimeter alarm. If they have a motion, it might be on, it might not be on, because guess what? Most people forget how to turn their alarms on. They forget how to operate them. But what they often remember how to do is turn on the perimeter alarm. Does anybody know why? Perimeter alarm is what most people like to turn on at night when they're at home, so they can still walk around the house. So they haven't forgot how to turn on the away alarm, which activates the motion. Uh, I mean, they have, they, they've forgotten how to turn that, but the one that they use every night, they haven't forgot to turn on. So that's typically the one they set when they're gonna be away. So if you've got your perimeter armed, I can still shatter a window, climb in, and never set off your alarm. And guess what? That is happening to us over and over and over again. So in a few minutes, I'm gonna remind you, learn how to work your alarm. And what are the different steps you need to do to strengthen that alarm? So I, I kind of wanted you to get an idea of what these shattered windows look like because I go to people's houses all the time. They're like, oh yeah, I've got a laminate here. Or I've got this and that's not going to happen and, and I've got it covered. So they kind of dismiss me sometimes. So the problem is, is I have seen every type of window um, busted. The only window that it took them a long time to get into was this last year and it was in Pelican Hills, just Pelican Hills, I think. And it was one off of one of the, um, the I don't even know, my husband's a golfer, but well, he doesn't golf anymore, but it, where the ball would go. Anyway, these windows, the suspects tried to break these windows. They used all the tools, they did everything they could to, to bust these windows, and they couldn't get in them. Finally, they got up to the, the second, one of the second story balconies, this house had multiple balconies, and they took a metal bird statue, and they managed to bust a really small, tiny window, and then get in, unlock, and get into the house. They couldn't bust any of the windows. I talked to one of the, um, uh, people from the Homeowners Association and he said, well, Andy, I think why they couldn't get those windows to bust is those were um, golf ball resistant windows. So they're built in such a way to uh, defend against the golf balls hitting the window and shattering it. That is the only window or only house that I have seen them try so, so hard and have complete difficulty getting in. So I don't know, golf ball glazing glass on your windows. But the windows on that were, they didn't look like most windows. They were hugely thick. They, they didn't look like a standard window. That is the only one. This one down here is a stationary bathroom window, the far one over with the arch. Stationary bathroom window, shatter it. It was really nice because all the laminate just keeps everything together so they just peel it. I have picture after picture somewhere they just peeled it aside and they just walk right in. Um, this one they could have chose here with the yellow. They could have chose to come in through the kitchen door because it's glass. A lot of times they'll go that way. For whatever reason, they picked the stationary kitchen window right there, shattered it, and came in that way. The only reason I think they didn't pick that one is because their thought was if I shatter the door, if there's a sensor, maybe I'll move it in just enough that it'll set the alarm off. But if I come in through that stationary one, guaranteed there's nothing on that window and you can get in. Um, the little picture up there, I just wanted to give you an idea. That's one of them where they've attempted to bust the window and they couldn't. That's actually the one where I told you they attempted to break the window and then they went in through an unlocked window. So that's typically what it looks like. Now, more, a lot more we're seeing those where they're actually using um, the glass break, the little punch to break the glass. But in the past, we've seen if you've got pavers laying around your house, um, pretty much anything you have, we've seen them come with flathead screwdrivers and just um, push it into where the wood and the glass meet and just push it, push it, push it, and then it pops. And then they just peel it back and, and push it in. So easy, easy way to get in. Because it's that easy, this is what's happened. 2005, we had seven where that was the method of entry. 2016, we saw it jump from seven. Before that, I don't even really have a consistent number. Seven up to 35. And then they were like, wow, this is just too easy. And so last year, we saw it go up to 46. The fact that we've had so many already this year, it's just, I'm afraid it's gonna be the same thing unless we change the way we're securing our homes. And that's why I'm glad that we're here tonight. It doesn't matter the door, it doesn't matter the size. The other thing I wanted to point out, I put up two bathroom windows. So that one is a stationary bathroom window. The one before it was a stationary bathroom window. The reason they hit your bathroom is because 90% of the public keeps their valuables in their master closet, which is usually located in a master bathroom. So most people do not have a motion sensor in that part of their house. Your motion, if you have a typical standard alarm, you've got your perimeter, doors and windows armed, 
They've installed a central motion for you in the house because they've told you if they break in here or there, they're going to have to cross because they're going to run through. That's how they sold it to you. The problem is the bad guys have taken advantage of that, and that's why I think they're hitting the houses that have the signs because they're banking on the fact that you have a traditional alarm. You've got to put a motion sensor in your master bathroom. And you're going to see down the way why another reason I think that's important. It's got to be there because here, this house, it doesn't matter how your house was alarmed. If you don't have a motion in there, they're in and out. And guess what? They're in and out. They're oftentimes with your safe and your valuables. Um, and it, it's just devastating. So you've, you've got to fix that. So what is, if you're going to use an alarm system, and I don't think you have to have an alarm system, but if you're going to use an alarm system as one of your layers, this is what you need to consider. You need to know how it works. Seriously, if you do not know how your alarm works, you need to call up the company. If it's old and you've not used it for a long time, then you maybe need to see about investing in something new or getting it tweaked. Um, I can't tell you the best uh, alarm company to go with, and I'll tell you why. Nobody relays this information. So there's no way for me even to find out where the best alarm company is. What I wish, and I've said this at many community meetings, is I wish that the realtors in town would survey their um, uh, their customers when they sell a home and when they purchase a home and kind of quiz them on what their experience is with the alarms and build a just kind of an impartial database because if you go online it's really hard to find it's really word of mouth you need to talk to your neighbors are they happy with their service um, what you've got to think about if you have an alarm even if it goes off there's always a delay when the police department is notified depending on how you have set up your rules with the alarm company they're probably going to call the house first to confirm that it's a legitimate person in there they give a code and it's fine. If nobody answers, then what's the next step? Do they call you on a number you've given them? Do they call a neighbor or do they call the police? What have you told them to do? By then, the bad guys are gone. Um, so that's why we'll talk about cameras in a minute, why I think the cameras are another layer that you, you need to add to it. But learn how it works. You need to have an exterior siren. I have confirmed that we don't have any um, problems with you having an exterior alarm. The only problem you'll have is if you do not know how to operate your arm, alarm and it keeps going off, then your neighbors are not going to be happy. So first figure out how to use your alarm and use it right, and then make sure you have an external alarm. The external alarm now gets your neighbors working with you as well. Because we, I read reports every year where the suspects are in the house and the alarm is going off. But guaranteed, the alarm is not being heard outside. And if there's any accomplice outside and they know that alarm's not being heard, that suspect's going to continue to go through your house because they know they've got that three minutes they need, probably six, probably 12 minutes to be in your house. And you're going to find in a few minutes, time is, is what the bad guys want. They want your stuff, but you give them a little bit of time, and they're going to get all your stuff. So um, definitely an exterior siren. If you've got an interior one, yes, but you need to add an exterior one. Your sensors, you need to have your door, maybe some lower levels, windows um, censored, it kind of depends. Um, any easily accessed second story entry points, those should probably be alarmed. And then this is what I think is key, is your motion, motion sensor. sensor. <laughs> Central part of the house, I still think that's a great idea. Master bedroom or bathroom. And then I think it's important that you establish three methods of setting the alarm. The two traditional ones, away and stay. But if you have pets, I think you need to add this to your, um, your choices. And the pet one would basically arm everything except the central motion. And then what you could do is you could allow your pet, dog or cat, most of them, they, the newer ones, you're, you're not going to worry so much about the animals. but dog or, or, or cat can roam around the house and then you shut your master bedroom door and that motion is activated. So if somebody comes in the house and makes their way to the master, that is now going to activate the alarm. If they come in through the window, the alarm is now activated. So that's what I think if you're going to use your alarm, some things you should be considering. So it's not just shattering the windows. That's not just how they're getting in. We are still having them force open doors all the time. I have screws back there. You wonder what the screws are for. The screws are for you to take home, take a couple of them, check your current strike plate, and see if you've got three inch screws. If you don't, if it's only an inch and a half, which is what oftentimes comes with your um, hardware when you purchase it, put in a couple of our um, three inch screws just to make it that much more difficult to kick in the door. Most of these, you can see those trim pieces hanging. Most of those screws just go into the trim. And so here you've got this hardy deadbolt that you're trusting to keep your front door strong. You got that inch throw, 
and that inch throw is going into a strike plate that's only secured to the trim, flimsy wood that many of us women in here could probably break, right? I mean, I don't do a lot of working out, but I probably could kick that door open if that's what um, has it, it, it's installed with. So you can either go with a security strike plate that has the four, or just grab two of our, our screws and stick them into your existing strike plate. So something really easy, easy to do. Oh, and um, let me go back real quick. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, the 47%, so doors, no matter what, as far as our forced entry, that is the primary entry point. They are gonna try to force a door. If we see any force of any kind happening, it is to a door, not, not to a window. So I wanna talk about securing your valuables. Um, like I said, most people put it in a master bedroom closet. If you do that, don't bother to put a deadbolt on it because what I told you is time is what these burglars want. You putting the deadbolt there just saved them a boatload of time because guess what, I'm not looking anywhere else. If you felt it important enough to put that deadbolt there, that is where I'm going. Um, if I found my way into your house, I'm gonna have no problem getting through that door. Um, this was from this year. Another picture that I have from this year is a similar door and the suspect just um, punched out the lower um, wood panel in the bottom of the door and climbed right in. So do not put the deadbolt unless you have other layers or that are not gonna provide the, the burglar with the time to be in your house. If you've got all the other layers going, then yes, put, put, put this deadbolt in. But if you don't have any external layer, layers before this point, if you thought this was gonna secure your stuff, this is not the way to go. So safes, um, you can't really see that up there. So safes, which I mentioned, given the time, these are all examples of uh, suspects being able to get into safes. That top one, those two orange circles, um, are highlighting the bolts that were used to secure that safe in place. If any of you have been to my talks before, I tell you, you have to have your safe bolted to the ground. But a second story um, bedroom is not the place for it to be bolted. It's going into wood, and I see those ripped out all the time. I have yet to see one ripped out of concrete on a bottom floor. Garages, great if they can't move it out. This one right here would be the second large safe that we've seen cut into in the last year and a half. Um, and that was in a garage. Once again, that one was given time. Uh, this particular neighborhood had a trusted individual they felt in their neighborhood that would walk dogs. And this person was trusted to watch houses. And uh, this was one of the houses he was entrusted to watch. The people were gone for several months. And he provided access to um, people who use drugs for a living. And they went throughout the house cut into the safe and then burglarize the house. He himself burglarized several other houses in the community. While that was happening, we also had a burglar crew that was also in the neighborhood. So this poor neighborhood was hit by people living internally and then people coming externally as well. Um, so given the time they can get through there, definitely think you need to bolt your safe, but they need to be bolted um, to concrete. If it's easy enough to pick up and walk away, it might. And that's where these numbers come into play. So the other problem that I saw is that 2015 and 16, five safes were taken. I'm not even talking about gotten into, I'm talking about actually left the house. But last year, 13. Already the first two months of 2018, we've had four safes leave our city. One of those safes being a 900 pound safe out of a second story bedroom that was bolted to a wood floor and um, surrounded by a cabinet. So those suspects hit three homes on that street and um, they did not come with the tools. They went to the garage and they used the person's tools at that home to get it out. Sure, why not? They also, um, they're very uh, creative. So how do you get a 900 pound safe out when you didn't bring the tools to do it? You put it on the comforter, you drag it to the top of the stairs, and then you try to get it down to the stairs until you lose your leverage and the whole safe goes flying down the stairs, shattering the stairs on the way down onto the wood tile floor and destroys that as well. And then, Lucky enough, this is the second house um, back in April 2000, I'm sorry, last year, last April, um, we had three homes hit in Harbor Ridge, gated community in one weekend. In that house, in that neighborhood, two of the windows were shattered as well. One shattered went in, they found a 600 pound safe at that house. The one thing that both those houses have in common is that they had the wooden um, furniture moving dollies in the garage and the suspects took advantage of their furniture moving dolly oh, to get the safe out. So. They will use what you have. The most important part up there, if given the time. So I think 
that you can have all these things and it can be secure, but you have to have a good alarm that you're using all the time. You have to have good locks and lighting, good neighbors, and you need to put things in such a way that it's not easy to be taken um, out of your house. So don't think that if you have a second story, you're okay. Um, these are both from Newport Coast, gated communities. This one right here, um, I've, I've shown before, so many of you have probably seen it. These people were out of the country, um, had a person watching their cat for them. They left the master bedroom window above the tub open two inches on both sides so the cats could get some fresh air. The pet sitter came one day and realized the coat closet was open, thought that's odd, instantly realized he did not leave it that way, gets out and calls the police immediately. Best thing to do when you think somebody's been in the house or is still in the house. What we found when we walked around the house is that the suspects had used these patio bar stools, chairs, stacked them up, one, two, three. They were up through the window, went through the master bedroom, and then out the front door. This one over here, while the people were out to dinner one night, Move the patio chair, one, two, three again, in and out. Once they got up to the second story, they shattered the window and that's how they got in and out of the master um, bedroom. So they, they can get in. I come to people's house all the time and I give them suggestions and they're like, oh, there's just no way that can happen. The other one that I didn't have a picture of there was also in Newport Coast this last year where the suspect or the victim went out to dinner. Suspect uses just the patio bar stool and a standard green garden hose, throws it up, it loops around the wrought iron, he shimmies up it, gets up there, shatters one glass door leading into the master closet and another glass door leading into the master um, bathroom, burglarizes upstairs and then went out the front door. What is the chance? He came with nothing. He used a standard garden hose. So it can be done. So what I think that you have to have is in addition to your locks, lighting, and landscape, which has always been traditional, we need to step it up with technology. And it's really easy now. There is a lot of do-it-yourself um, cameras out there. And if you simply talk to friends, type it in on nextdoor.com, you know, does anybody have a you know, good source or who's using a, a good camera that they like? You will get information. Cameras are like cell phones. I like an Android, my husband likes an Apple. Um, there's not a perfect one, it's what works best for you. So I think you need to add that. A doorbell camera is definitely a must, not only to capture or to deter um, package thieves, but also for you to allow, um, to give the impression that you're home, whether you're out dining at dinner or if you're in another state vacationing. I want you to be able to acknowledge that you're home through that doorbell camera. There's different versions. You can set them up in different ways. I think people that lived in communities that have terraced homes and you often don't have a person living across the street from you to easily see onto your front door, you need to replace your intercom leading into your courtyard and replace it with some type of a doorbell camera. Um, you need to set up in such a way that anybody that steps onto your steps, if they're walking their dog, it shouldn't be going off, but if they come up to your, your door area, you should be notified. I, it, it's so simple and it's easy to do. I, I think people need to do that. And those images, depending on the camera you get, it needs to go to your phone. There are different kinds of cameras. There's great cameras. People will get great cameras with great um, clarity and they record nonstop. Those are great, but those are investigative cameras. Those aren't going to deter a burglar. Just so you know, cameras don't necessarily deter burglars because what do we see on all of our images of the burglars most of the time? they just pull their hoodie down. Okay, so they just tighten it up or they cover their face or here over in Irvine Terrace, we had them spray paint the cameras. So if they see the camera, that is not, some burglars, it may deter. Some burglars, it's not gonna deter. So just realize that I think a camera that records is great in the long run, capturing a lot of footage. If it shines out onto the street and we can capture cars driving by, people riding by on bikes, I think that's great. But you also have to have a, a simple camera that's going to send you notification when there's movement in or around your home. Quick and easy. And then maybe you're going to all of a sudden pull up your other cameras and start watching. But something that's going to alert you that there's activity around your home is important. So, like I said, I, I can't give you the brand because it's all unique to what you want to do, but here are just some kind of names and, and ideas. So, the ring which is the Ring doorbell. If you already have a Ring doorbell, then you know what, go to their site and look at the other cameras that they, and products they have. They pretty much have you set up for all the way around the house. Right now, to the best of my knowledge, but they're coming out with things every day, so it might have come out today and I don't know this, but they don't have anything internal in the house. 
But that's your perimeter, and they go off due to motion. One has a floodlight. They, they do a bunch of different things. Um, you can wire them to a solar um, charger so you don't have to take it down and charge the batteries. But one thing about all these cameras, in order to make it work, you need to put them in such a place that you are not getting notified all the time. Because guess what? Constant notification, guess what? You're annoyed, you shut it off, you don't use it. That's not what we want. What I want, if you can't do anything but put a simple interior um, camera like these um, Canarios or Arlo's, they can be put inside the house. Um, the canary is usually just a standalone. Some of these do extra things, but they'll gauge if you've got carbon monoxide, if there's smoke, um, you know, the temperature of the house. A lot of these will also allow you to speak through them to somebody, um, set off a siren. So there's all these different things that they can do. So you need, today is just to start you on your research on what you need to look for. So you need to, con um, you need to confirm that you've got a power source, that you've got a backup power source. Um, if your power is cut, the beginning of 2017, we saw five residential burglaries where the power was shut off. So if this was your, what you were using, probably would have not have been working for you. And so um, you would have been burglarized. So you need to find something, either you're gonna put a camera over your power box, and so you're gonna know if there's any suspicious activity over there, or you're gonna find a device that's gonna allow to be a backup and it's gonna be able to keep operating if your power is off. Your internet's still gonna operate and your, your power for your cameras will still operate. The camera placement is very important because that is what is going to notify you. That's, that's where you're going to get the um, excessive notifications if you put it in a poor spot. So be willing to work with it. All of these, if you see the one with the, holding the hand, all of these have um, unique systems that allow you to set and gauge you know, how you're going to receive the notification, how the camera is going to work. Whatever you get, make sure you get something that's easy to operate and that you're willing to work with a little bit so that you can make it fit your lifestyle. But this, an ideal situation would be, yes, a hardwired alarm in addition to one of these cameras. And then if you want to still invest in a, a camera that's kind of just recording 24 hours, that would be great too. The other problem law enforcement that we see is people that have the cameras that are recording, they can't quickly get us the images. The thing with some of these cameras, like the Arlo Ring, Canary, all of these, our officers can be responding to a phone call, I mean, responding to a call of a burglary. Let's say your neighbor is now out there talking to the officer. You're in another state. You're able to send an image to your neighbor. Now our officer has it, or send it to the officer's phone. We make a stop down the road. Guess what? We're able to ID the person at that time. What has happened, traditionally happened, someone will have good camera footage, or the neighbors might have camera footage. We wait two or three days. Yeah, finally now it's a business day. Their security person has been able to make a copy. Now we're getting it, but we've wasted so much time. Investigative cameras are, are great, but oftentimes, I'll be honest, if you're a victim of residential burglary, burglary, your chances of getting your valuables back, very slim. Wouldn't you rather prevent your items from ever being taken by being notified when there's suspicious activity around your home with one of these cameras before they get in? I think that would be the most ideal situation. So these also rely on your internet. I don't know how much, what your internet will support. Will it support five cameras? Will it support two cameras? Um, a lot of these do-it-yourself cameras. They're pretty easy, but it'll walk you through it. It'll talk to you about it. You can go to places like Best Buy and talk to them um, when you purchase it. Or you can just go to their websites and they give you a lot of really good information. Or better yet, you get on nextdoor.com and I guarantee you have a neighbor that is um, savvy in this and they will be able to explain it and they're willing to help you out. So I, that's what I think is an important resource as a neighbor. So the other thing that you can do, we talked about technology, but just basic common sense. Okay, packages, these are both homes that were burglarized and there's packages out front. So what does a package say? Package out front of a house tells me nobody is home. So not only do you run the risk of having the package taken, but you run the risk of your house being burglarized because what did I tell you a burglar is looking for? An empty house, an empty house that gives them time to operate in the house. And that's what that's saying. A dark home during evening hours, Everybody's home tonight. When you get home, if it's a little dark, it should be well lit when you walk in. You should have perimeter lights that are coming on automatically with photocells. I don't even love timers because the timers, you know, they get off. Photocells are awesome. They just come on and off when the, when the sun goes down and when the sun comes up. Um, your blinds, if you're gonna go out of town and you don't ever close those front blinds, don't start doing it when you go out of town. I mean, that if someone's been paying attention, 
I, I know everyone says, well, we get construction. I'm worried about the construction workers in our neighborhood. Okay, well, there's somebody that's there every day. If all of a sudden your windows are open and now they're closed, sure sign that you're gone. Um, and I don't necessarily think it's, you know, people are worried, where are these bad guys coming from? Well, th they're probably not the construction workers in your neighborhood, but have they talked, because when we're arresting them, they're not construction workers. Um, but have they talked to a friend of a friend of a friend and said, wow, this is a you know, beautiful neighborhood. It's kind of crazy that they just leave things wide open. They've got this and they've got that. And then does somebody down the road go, yeah, where, where was that that you're working at now? And you share that and before you know it, that starts bringing in different people. We've had organized gangs from LA that have come, that, that this is their career, this is what they do. They break into homes, they're quick, they know what to do. Um, that 900 pound safe that I mentioned being taken recently, that actually was recovered. Um, I talked to one of the detectives that was recovered in LA in a not so great neighborhood uh, in a vacant home that this guy is getting ready to remodel. He showed up at the house to work on it and here's this safe that has been broken into. The fortunate thing with that safe is it had a lot of cash and it had guns in it. So when the suspects got into it and they found the cash and the guns, they stopped looking. And so luckily, this doesn't ever happen, but the victims were able to get their jewelry back because they did not find the jewelry that had fallen down in the, the safe someplace. And so our CSI um, officer, when he was cleaning and printing and looking at the, the thing, found their jewels in there. And so that was kind of a nice thing that they got that back. But that doesn't always happen, just so you know. Um, so we, we, need to, we need to not advertise when our homes are, are vacant. So the other thing I, I think I just mentioned, kind of knowing your neighbors, talking to your neighbors, some other things you want to do is sign up on Nixle. If you get the handout that I have in the back, the checklist, it'll give you the information for signing up on Nixle. Um, that way you'll receive crime alerts, um, if we've had road closures, things like that, we don't bombard you. I'm not going to tell you every time a vehicle is burglarized in your neighborhood because after two days you'd be tired of hearing it because it happens so often. We provide so much opportunity to, to these um, burglars when it comes to our cars. So crime alerts, community advisors, traffic things. The number one thing we need um, as a police department is we need you to call us when you see things suspicious and out of place. And you don't call us after you've talked to your husband, wife, spouse, or talked to three neighbors and decided, yeah, that didn't seem right. No, the second you see it and it looks out of place and it just stands out to you, call us. Give us a call. That's the non-emergency number. It goes straight to dispatch. The same dispatcher that's answering our 911 lines is answering that. So if it goes from being a non-emergency call to an emergency, you can let them know at that time. That's also the best number if you're walking, driving around, that's the best way to get a hold of us if you see a car accident because you're talking right to us. When you call 911 on your cell phone, if you're close to one of our neighboring cities or the toll road, you could go to the neighboring cities or to CHP. And so if it's an emergency and you need us right away, non-emergency number is, is the most important number. And then it's also important with your neighbors to establish communication. If you don't know your neighbors, you just need to get on a face-to-face -face wave high um, uh, relationship with them. You don't have to be best friends, but it would be nice if you were going to be out of town, if you could let them know, hey, I'm going to be out of town. If you see my lights on past midnight, you know, please give the, the police department a call and let us come check it out. Nothing is, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our lieutenants said, we're in the job of being um, bothered. So, Nothing you can do can bother us. That is what our job is. Our job is to come out when you hear things at night, when you see things at night, when you're um, unsure about what's going on, let us look into it. Don't put yourself in harm's way. Let us take care of it. So that handout back there will also give you the um, number to the alarms person, and she can help you with any alarm questions you have. And then it will also give you the number for vacation checks. If you go out of town, you can always give us a call, and our volunteers will come by and check your house. What happens oftentimes when you get busy and you get ready to go out of town, you forget to lock and secure things. And that is when the burglars you know, will take advantage of those um, opportunities. And so by having our volunteers come by, check your doors, windows, if we find something unlocked, we call an officer, they walk through the house, they secure it, they check it out, and we know everything's fine. So, and just so you know, all the years I've been here since we started that program, we have never had one of our houses hit that the person has been on vacation. So I know people are always worried, well, why doesn't someone just follow them and then they'll know which one? No, because if, you're, if, if we're going to that house, it's probably an engaged neighborhood. It's probably a neighborhood that knows there's, who lives there and that no one's there. And if somebody, something suspicious does happen at that house, we're probably gonna be the first to know about it. So that's a really good thing to get us involved. I think that's the end of my, yep. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, let me just put that. So I'm going to go ahead and, yes. A what? Speak. 
Oh, I think they're they're going to hold the microphones. Yeah, that's what we're Okay, so they're going to go around. If you have a question, if you raise your hand, and they'll bring the mic over to you so you can answer it so everybody can, can hear. Uh, what about if your house is posted like no solicitors and people are constantly knocking on your door and trying to solicit you for this, that, or the other thing? How do you handle that? Do, don't they have to have a permit from the city to knock on doors or not? Yes, so that's a good question. So she's asking about solicitors going door to door. Yes, they do. So here's the problem, though. The only people that really know that they have to, excuse me, have a permit are the people that are coming to the police department to get the permit. Mm -hmm. um, so this is for you to know. If someone comes to your door, first of all, don't open your door to anybody you don't know. You can talk to them through a closed door and tell them you're not interested. Put up a no soliciting sign. With that no soliciting sign, you can always register your address as a no soliciting house, and the legitimate solicitors who get a permit will know that you're on the no soliciting list. The ones that are not legitimate that come to your door and then they try to smooth talk you and tell you, you know, I talked to Mrs. Smith down the street and this and that. No, if you've got a no soliciting sign and they're attempting to solicit you, they don't have a permit because they have been warned. They paid money. They know they're not supposed to be at that house. How, how do you file the no soliciting? Through the police department? So, yeah. So you. Yeah. So I, I really think really the only thing you have to do is have the no soliciting sign. Once you have the no soliciting sign, if they come and you tell them no, I'm not interested. You're not supposed to solicit at homes that have a no soliciting sign. If they continue or are aggressive, then you're going to call that non-emergency number and ask an officer to come out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My question uh, relates to uh, alarm systems. Just two questions. Uh, first one is um, cellular versus landline. And are you finding a trend where burglars, burglars are cutting the phone line or disabling it? And my second question is motion, uh, I'm sorry, uh, glass shattering sensors. Are those working <coughs> expense? Are they effective or not? Okay, so this is, this once again goes to your hardware that you're getting. And I cannot, I, I'm not an expert on hardware or what companies you're going with or what, what hardware they're using. So let's first do the cellular landline. That kind of also depends on what your house is and what works best for your house. And that's kind of a understanding, that's not gonna affect our response or how we get you know, the information. So that is clearly up to you. Phone lines being cut, no. I think in all my years here, I wanna say one time that I can think of, and I think that was an in-house thing with a, a, an employee, and somebody owned a business. So have not seen that. The power being turned off was the first thing that we've really seen last year, other than seeing those random over the years to have five of them last year at the beginning was kind of odd, um, but we haven't seen that since. Now your other one as far as the glass break. So here's the thing, all these different sensors, whether it's a vibration or a sound or whatever, you need to work with your alarm person. You need to ask them, will my windows work? What, what, what causes that glass break to work? Because glass breaking sounds different at all houses. I've heard it as an explosion. You've seen the way that I've showed you some I've showed you only tempered glass. I've not showed you the ones that it's not the tempered glass that are jagged and the suspects don't come through because they basically created a guillotine and they do not go through those windows. So I've only showed you those, but what, what does that sound like? You need to confirm with the company because all those might sound differently. I don't know what's gonna cause the device that you're buying to activate. So I would have that between them and see what they show you as, as what makes it work. So one, one over there, yeah. Right. Anyway, um, so um, I don't know if this would relate to you, but I do know uh, Dover Shores and um, on the east side, Costa Mesa, that um, a lot of uh, sober living houses, um, the kids are encouraged to go get jobs, and they get jobs working for catering companies, they get jobs working for uh, moving companies, and um, they get jobs working as caregivers in the homes and pet walkers and pet sitters. So I just wondered if that has any relation. You, you said a couple there, but the other robberies, have there recently been a move to that home where they someone delivered furniture and brought it into the home? Or I know for a fact that the, um, I talked to your police department and the Mesa Police Department about this, and they says yes, and they've actually found stolen property in the pawn shops on Newport Boulevard from homes around here. Okay, so so you had a lot of lot of statements there. So are the the sober living homes you're asking are the, the people that 
that work there. They, so I, I couldn't tell you, are we arresting them from there? No. Now, are, are burglars, do they have a drug problem? Are, are many of them looking for cash and stuff for drugs? In some cases, yes. I'll tell you, most of the druggies, a lot of them, they're the ones doing the car hopping. They're checking your cars and stuff. Most of our burglars, to get a 900-pound safe out and get into that, that's a little more of a professional crew. So I'd say the majority of our residential burglaries are probably career burglars, or, or that's kind of what their choice. The druggies, the ones that want the quick cash, some gift cards to sell, um, maybe some information you know, from your car, yeah, but, but is it specific to a rehab home, or do we just have a problem with people that are addicted to drugs kind of all over, whether or not they're living in a home, they're just out here. With all these different propositions, there, there are more people out looking for opportunity now than ever before, yes. And what happens now when we arrest them for a misdemeanor in our community, our community's not like many of the communities, our officers will arrest somebody, take them back and book them, even if it is a misdemeanor. The unfortunate thing, due to the law changes, they're probably out on the street before the officer finishes a report. And in many cases, they have committed a property crime before the end of that evening. That's just unfortunately what we're dealing with. Would I direct it to, to those places? I'd say we've, we've got people like that all over the community, and I can't say it is just to those. I couldn't actually say that. So another question? Oh. I'm curious, along the line, you talk about random, uh, you see a lot of burglars here. Any way of going, how many of those are just random hits, or how many somebody's playing after something they know is there? Random pound safe, or a house is full of jewelry. <coughs> how much is random? How much, any way of knowing that uh, your house is a target? So I, I would say, because many of these neighborhoods, I've, I've been to the houses over the years in the neighborhoods, or I've seen the images of them. Um, so much of Newport is very much alike in different neighborhoods. And so finding that people have kept their valuables in the house is not uncommon. Safes, not uncommon. The, the reason why you're seeing this is because all of this is not uncommon for our community. This is our community. Um, do I think they've been targeted? I don't think so. I think in this, this one particular neighborhood, it's easy. They're terraced homes. You could have a great fortress in the front of your house, but guess what? When you go backyard to backyard to backyard to backyard, it's only as secure as your neighbor on either side of you because you can move up and down the backyard so easily. And that's just one, a few of our types of neighborhoods here. But um, in some cases, uh, maybe it's, I, I will say I do know of a few of them that it's either been family members or known suspects. We, we do have those ex-spouses, um, kids, um, family members that have drug problems. Those do account for, for some of those. So if you, if you took out some of those that were known suspects or people that knew those people had things, our numbers would be way down because there are a good significant number of those. Yes. What is the percentage of daytime burglaries versus after dark burglaries? Okay, that, so that's really hard because if the house has been vacant for two weeks, I don't know when the burglary occurred. Um, the ones that are really easy to pinpoint are the ones that are daytime, and we, we do have a lot of daytime ones. Um, and then the dinnertime ones are easy because people go to dinner. But there are a large number of them that happen while people are on vacation, and so I don't have a good number because um, a lot of times it's a span of time, and it might be from morning to night. Somebody might um, live here, live at, leave at 6 a.m. in the morning to go to work in L.A. and not come back till 10, and we've got that whole chunk of time to look at. So it, that's, that's a hard one. What, what I encourage people when I talk about different layers, um, you, your layers in your home need to a, a, account for daytime burglars and nighttime burglars. I have a question regarding how many patrol officers are assigned to the different areas of Newport Beach, say, in Harvard Bean Hills. How many patrol officers are in that area? Okay, so for officer safety, we don't like release those numbers, but I will tell you the way, the way our city operates, and I, I apologize, I don't have the city um, map up right now. I'm trying to think if I have something that has some numbers on here real quick. Um, no. Um, so what happens is we have assigned areas um, officers for each given area. Our city's broken up into reporting districts and we have um, four areas. The peninsula being one, and then uh, north of the peninsula, like Hogue Hospital from the bay, that's area two. This side of the bay to uh, MacArthur right here is area three up to the like airport area. And then this side is area four. And so we have officers assigned to that area and they're constantly patrolling. Obviously, um, we'll have uh, areas that have higher crime will have more officers in that area. But we have them out patrolling all the time. But here's the thing, 
you could have a bunch of officers here, but we take an arrest or we have a traffic accident or you have the power go out, and now our resources are lessened. So that's why for us in this community, it's so important that we have community involvement that when you see something out of place, you direct our attention because we are, we are responding to that. And just to give you guys an idea, we have over 200 calls for service on average a day that we're responding to. So it can be a wide variety of things. Once again, we're in, we're in the business of, of responding to your calls and taking care of things, but we, we definitely need your help. We can't be everywhere. And just one more thought, the law that you said that applies where the criminal is out and back in business again before the report is written, when are they held and when are they released? So if it's, a, it's, if it's a felony, so that the way things have changed is a lot of the um, drugs that used to be felony charges that we would, if, depending on the type of drug that they were arrested for, we would take them into custody at the PD and then we'd send them up to, to Santa Ana. That is not the case now for those, those types of, of um, arrests. So the other thing is property crimes. So if somebody, it's the value of the property. So if somebody takes that items out of your car that are over $950, then that becomes a felony. If they steal something over $950, then that, that increases it. But for the most part, everything is under that, that these people are going through and taking. So that's, they know the law. The other thing that happened is when that law was put in place, it was retroactive. So the very next day, everybody that was in prison for those charges could now apply to get out. So, yes. Simple questions about prevention. Um, packages, everybody's shopping online. So you have a package delivered and you're out for an hour, what do you do about that? And the second question is, where's a better place to hide my valuables instead of the bedroom closet? So I have some in the garage or the kitchen or where else would be a safer place they wouldn't look? Yeah, so kind of probably the safest place is the, um, the bank and the safety deposit box, but then you're not going to use them. The other thing is, is you put them in a safe, and if the safe is not easily accessible, you're probably not going to use them, so you end up leaving them out. So I, um, I encourage people, when I come to their house, I encourage them to get creative. Uh, don't, really it shouldn't be any place in your master bedroom, but if you have a piece of furniture someplace else in the house that has like a lip underneath that you could, you know, put a little piece of wood and you could slide something up under there in an envelope, extra cash. Oh, the other place is not only the master bedroom, but your office. If they have time, the office is the next place they're going to go to. So things cannot stay in the office as well that are just out in the open, you know, credit cards, extra cash, things like that. But you kind of have to be creative. Now, anything that you've heard, like putting jewelry and pockets in your clothes in the closet, yeah, you hear that, they know that. Books, you've seen the new, oh, was it the ADT ad, or, or is it ADT or whatever, where the guy walks in and he takes the fake book and that's where the cash is and stuff like that. Anything you've heard about, they've done. I, it, you just have to walk your house and you have to kind of look. Are there little hidden places? Are there places that are not easily seen? Um, are there pillows or things in certain areas that if I unzipped it, I could hide something up in there. But then here's the real problem when you do that. You better make a list someplace because guess what? <laughs> you are gonna be calling us saying, you know, I, I think I hit it, but I don't, not sure if I hit it. So um, yeah, yeah, you have to be creative. And I gotta tell you, it's the one time that somebody took off their ring to clean it or do something and then they got called away to visit a family member in the hospital. You would not believe how many of these kind of strange things that people do things they've never done. And that is the one time that their house got hit and their ring that they never take off was laying there, you know. So I hear these things all the time. So it's, yeah, it's just kind of being kind of consistent and always putting it away. What about packages on the doorstep? No, other than, other than either have a, this is why neighbors are good. Be able to, you know, text your neighbor and say, hey, I don't know if you're around, but can you grab my package? Or um, you know it's there, so instead of running to the drugstore, you're going to run by the house first and grab it, you know, or try not to get it delivered at that time or have it delivered someplace else. Yeah, that's a tough one. And I got to tell you, package stuff goes underreported because many people might report it to the, the post office or they just call Amazon and they get their a new shipment of whatever was taken. And so we don't hear about all those package thefts. We hear about a bunch of them, but not all of them. Deliver it to Amazon lockers. There you go. Yeah. So, okay. There are people who keep a loaded gun at home or multiple guns at home, it's usually good only if you're confronted by somebody who comes into the house. So what percentage of the burglaries or break-ins, uh, is there a confrontation? 
so I got to tell you where, where it's an actual physical confrontation in 19 years I can think of one and that was in Harbor Ridge about four years ago and it was when a dad and daughter had left the house to go to a funeral the 20 some year old son was still at home and he was up in his bedroom and he heard the French door uh, alarm go off to notify you that somebody's the pool is, is somebody's gonna be in the pool area and he heard that go off and he looked out and he sees the burglar on one of the, the stairs down below and the burglar turns to flee but the 20 something year old is like no you're not and he flew down and so there was a, a fist fight down there and they got to fight the bad guy finally fled he he got away um, but those altercations like I said these are burglars they did not come now what they did come to do is take that gun and I got to tell you, so many people do not secure their guns. And most of the time, uh, if you have a gun in your house and it is not in a, in a uh, safe or secured someplace, your gun is what they want. That's money to them, and they're going to take it. Yeah. Is it oh. true that um, some burglars bring metal detectors so they can check around your house and figure out where the jewelry is? You know, that's the first I've ever heard of that. And I, and I got to tell you, I don't know that we've ever arrested anybody with that in their possession. but. Um, Hey, that would make sense. I will tell you that these guys know what is real jewelry and, and what isn't most of the time. So that's why you're asking about the druggie. Druggie's not going to know this. Oftentimes we'll have them go, they'll, we'll see people's jewelry all over a bed and they will have gone through and they will have found um, what they want. Is that because they're using a metal detector? I don't know. I've never seen that or heard that. Most of the time, we'll know what the suspects are using because when we make arrests, we'll find these objects on them, you know? Just like people are, you know, convinced that most of our uh, thefts from vehicles are, are because there's devices being used to unlock the cars. No, in Newport Beach, people are just leaving them unlocked, okay? We are not arresting people with these devices, although you're hearing that all over, and, and maybe in some places they're using them. I can't get people to lock their, their car doors to save their lives around here, so um, th th I haven't seen that yet. Not that it's not happening, I just might not know about it. Yes? Hi, I'm Andy Graduate. Thank you so much. I know. For <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention something that happened to me two nights in a row, and if you could comment on that. Um, I was at home, I would say it's probably 8 or 9 at night. Um, UPS man knocked on my door and wanted to deliver a package that I never ordered. And I said, through the door, sorry, I didn't order anything. Next night, a man came to say that he was uh, installing my Cox cable, which I also didn't order. And I said, no, I, I, don't, I didn't order cable. He said, oh, well, um, do you want cable? <laughs> which I thought was funny. If you're here to, to install it, then I have a valid order in your computer. Now you're switching to asking me if I want it. So um, are these people just trying to save somebody's home? Yeah, I, I guarantee those are just, you know, off the wall things that they, yeah, they're checking for an, an empty house. But that would be a call to us. I mean, anything, that's suspicious. Anything like that is a call to dispatch and say, you know, can you send an officer by? If you were able to see him through a peephole or at least kind of have an idea so you could give dispatch a description, that would be ideal. So call us immediately to get us in the area. That's, I have people take images and pictures of cars and they're like, Andy, I just thought you should see this. This was suspicious. So I took a, an image of it or they'll text it to me. Okay, me getting it four hours later, it does no good. Those things, if you see a suspicious vehicle driving through your neighborhood and it's suspicious and so suspicious that you take a picture of it, you need to call dispatch right away and give them that information because then they can stop them, they can question them, they can find out are you on um, parole, probation, what are your search and seizures, what can we do? Then you've given us some power. We need you to empower us to, to kind of do our job. Hi Andy. Hi. Um, you, you told us that you're, uh, uh, that you're retiring. And um, it's going to be a great loss. No, thank you. But um, I will share that you came through our house and, and did the 45 minute, 30 to 45 minute walkthrough and showed me all kinds of things that I didn't know were problems and different, gave me different advice. What can we as citizens do to solicit that kind of um, help from the police department? after year five. Okay, so there will be somebody to fill my, my position. It, I just don't, I'm, I don't know how soon it will be. I'm, I'm kind of guessing maybe closer to May. And that person will receive training and will know how, how to do all this and they can do it. So this is not something I think is going away. Just probably, I, I have to take a time out for a month and kind of put my desk in order so that I can hand over something um, good to the next person so that you guys can still continue to get the same level of service that this community expects from your police department. So um, we will still be doing that. My phone number, the, the crime prevention number on the bottom of that flyer goes directly to our desk. So that would be the number that you can call and, and leave a message for that. So thank you.
Thank you, Andy. That was a terrific presentation, a lot of valuable information. Um, I didn't know you were leaving. I, and this was going to be your last presentation. I would have baked a cake or something. Yeah. <laughs> I can come back next time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, Andy is just an example of just the terrific employees we have working for the city. And uh, I know you've worked really long and hard for the city. And uh, we really appreciate all the work you've done for us and the hundreds of presentations I know you've given. Now, don't forget uh, to come back next month. April 11th is our next program. Um, it'll be a good program, so uh, be sure and come back and uh, visit us again. And also, uh, our thanks out again to the bungalow for uh, their food this evening. And don't forget to uh, patronize them because they help us out all the time. And thank you very much.